declare that there is nothing greater than our Lord. Well, I search the world, but it couldn't fear me. The man's empty breaks and treasures that fade. Never enough that you came along, put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing. i 
I thank you once again for just this opportunity we had to, to gather together and to spend some time of worship in your word. Father, I ask that you help us to just be present here this morning. Um, Father, that uh, whatever else we've got going on, whatever we've got coming next, um, Father, that you would help us to just focus on the here and now. God, that we would just be present here today. Lord, I ask that during our time in the word that you would come, you would speak, may you bring your words in that way. Lord, I just ask during our time of worship that you would be honored and glorified by our time together. Holy Spirit, that you would come, you would speak, that you would speak to our hearts today. You would encourage us, challenge us, grow us. Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity we have to be here, to be present with you today. Father, we give you this time, we give you this place. We thank you so much for your son, for the sufficiency of his sacrifice, which makes it possible for us to enter your presence, which makes it possible for us to gather together today. And so it's in his precious and holy name we pray these things. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, good morning. Um, we've got a couple of things before we get into the message today. Um, first, and, and before I say anything, just as a general statement, um, so as, as a church from the stage, um, we do not get into political stuff just because we believe that there is plenty of us, plenty for us to talk about um, just in scripture without us having to get into that sphere, um, into that area. However, with what ha t happened yesterday, I did want to just say a couple of things. Um, just, you know, I, I understand that for, for some it could, you know, be a big deal. Some it may be a less big deal. Um, um, but, you know, just because of what happened that I wanted to say a couple of things. First, um, whether it's something that happens here in our nation, in the world, something that just happens in your life, that I want you to know that, that we, myself, the elders, Pastor Matt, staff, and, and even those who are around you, that we are here for you um, to talk to and, 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 and pray with you. Um, so whatever is going on, just know that you are not alone, uh, that we're here with you, and, and that... that, that um, any situation, any circumstance um, that you want to talk or, or pray about, that we are here. Um, and so we want you to know that there's just, there's always that open invitation um, that is available to you. Second, um, as Christians who live in this country, um, we have a responsibility to be praying, praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, um, period. Um, that is, we are biblically called to. We are biblically called to understanding that it is God who establishes who is leaders. Um, like he is the one who appoints. And so scripture calls us to pray, to pray for our leaders, to pray for those who serve our country, to pray um, for them and their families because they need it. They need it, right? And, and so we need to be in prayer. Um, um, and so if you take nothing else away from this, um, please take the encouragement and the challenge that, that we need to be praying. We need to be praying for for our nation, um, um, and and that's not a cop out. I don't say that as like a you know. Unfortunately, today many times people are like, oh, here come the Christians again, saying that they're going to pray for stuff. And it's like, but prayer is the most powerful thing that we have. Um, when we pray, we come to the Most High, the one who actually sits on the throne. Um, and so coming to Him is not a cop out, um, but it is the most valuable, most important thing that we can do. Um, so so we should be doing this, and we should be taking that stance, doing that. Third thing. Um, is that whether it comes off of the back of the events yesterday or just as a result of us getting closer and closer to election time, um, division is going to happen. Uh, there's going to be divisive conversations. There's going to be differing opinions, even within our church. I know for sure, for a fact, that we have people of different political leanings here. And I thank God for that. Um, I don't think that that's a negative. I think that we have to remember that as a, as a church, as a body of Christ, um, what unites us is not similar political views or similarities in any other capacity. Uh, what unites us is our hope in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. That's what we are united behind. Scripture says that he is the head of the body, which is us, the church, and that he is the joint by which each and every single one of us is joined together. So what unites us is not like, hey, I always think the same way as you do, but what unites us is that I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, and you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so whether we agree or disagree, we can remain in unity together in this and walk through life together because of what's most important which is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So I just encourage you that whether it's conversations you have 
in the coming weeks, because I know, right, it's going to be all over social media all week long. The news is going to talk about it all the time. And, 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 and it's only going to become more and more prevalent the closer and closer that we get to election day. Um, and I just, as you, as believers, have conversations, I just want to encourage you to have them in grace and mercy from an understanding that, hey, even if you and I don't agree on this, that we can acknowledge that this is a lesser thing um, and that what we do agree on is the most important thing. And let's keep our unity with that because that's where unity in the body of Christ comes from. So that's all I'm going to say on that. I just wanted to say that and address that. I felt like it was a good opportunity. And that's the reason why that we're not going to spend a whole lot of time because like, we are here to proclaim the kingdom of Jesus. That's why we're here. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on, what we're going to prioritize as a church. Um, and, and where you land and where you sit politically is that's for you and, and family and friends. If you want to talk with them about it, awesome. But for us, we're going to focus on the main thing. So um, with that, the second thing they have for us um, is, is um, much happier. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to have uh, our youth and leaders who uh, are leaving on Sunday. So next Sunday before church starts early in the morning, um, myself and these amazing people, most of them are here. Not everyone who's going is here, but most who are going are here. Um, these amazing people are going to be leaving next Sunday. Um, get this, okay? This is crazy, total God thing. Um, are going to Butler, Pennsylvania. We're going to Butler, Pennsylvania next week um, to serve that community alongside an existing ministry that's been doing ministry there for a long time. Um, and uh, so these awesome youths and adults and myself are going to go and we're going to do service projects during the day. We're going to do VBS during the day um, and, uh, and just go and, and lend a hand and serve that community, which every community needs service. But what an incredible time and opportunity for for our group that we get to send and they get to go and serve a community that's definitely uh, in need of encouragement and, and more light. Um, and so super excited about these uh, awesome individuals. And so what we're going to do today, because we won't be here uh, for service next Sunday, is we're going to, um, we're commissioning them. And so um, what we see in scripture, and, and we practice this when we do dedication, uh, when we brought M Pastor Matt on, anytime we bring a new elder on, what we see in scripture is that the church gathered around those that they sent, they laid hands on and they prayed over and they blessed them as they went. And so um, just as a symbol uh, of, of unity in this and, and, and recognition of this, I'm going to ask if you guys would stand and just stretch out a hand. Um, uh, this is just a sign of like, hey, we are in affirmation of this. We, we are in support of this. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to ask you that, that uh, um, not this coming week, but next week. So starting next Sunday, even this week, as you think about it, pray. But especially so next week, um, anytime you think about them, just pray for them. Pray that the Lord would, would work in them, that the Lord would work through them, that he would protect and guide, and all the conversations that need to happen would happen, and all that good stuff. But we're going to pray together this morning uh, as, as they prepare to head out. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for... God, for these youth and these adults who are giving of their time this next week um, to go and be your hands and feet. Um, Father, I ask that your spirit would go before them uh, and prepare the way, that, that, that hearts and minds and conversations and situations that you have appointed, God, that you would go and you would prepare and you would lay the foundation for the work that you have planned for this next week. Father, I pray for each individual here who is going, that you would prepare their hearts for what it is you have for them this next week. Uh, that for each of us, God, that you would prepare us to be your servants, to be your hands and feet while we are there. Um, Father, we just lift up Butler, Pennsylvania, and we lift up that community. God, we ask you would be present there. Father, we know uh, tragedy, grief, hardship, it happens. It is in our world, and it is real. Uh, but Father, we also know that you are a God who is present, who is available, and who cares. And so, Father, I ask that even now, God, that you would just make your presence so clearly known and felt in that community. And Father, that you would help us as we go to go and, and bring that as well. Um, Father, I pray for protection while we are there. I pray for safe travels as we go. Uh, God, we just ask you would just do a mighty work through uh, this group as they go, and you do a mighty work in them as they go. Father, we thank you that you are a God, um, God who, who desires to use us and has given us gifts and talents and abilities to use for your glory and for your kingdom. So, Father, that is what we ask. We ask that as they go this next week, God, that you would be glorified, you would be honored, you would be praised, that people would be brought into saving faith and relationship with you, uh, and that you are who is made known. 
Uh, Father, we thank you so much for these individuals. We ask that you bless them, bless them and their families as they go. Uh, and, and we ask all of this in unison and unities together today as we say, amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so today, we, uh, as we continue our series in Exodus, um, and like knowing that we were going to have the youth come up and pray over them, and as we go, um, just made me think about, I did, I did youth ministry for, for quite a while, um, and uh, I don't know if, if you were perhaps in a youth group, I would say probably like within like five to 10, maybe 15 years, or, or you helped in a youth group within that time frame, then you maybe remember the fun games that we used to play. Did you guys ever get to play fun games as a youth or as a youth leader helping in a youth? Do you remember some of the really awesome and exciting and totally not completely embarrassing things that we, like, okay, so, so like growing up in youth, we played a lot of games that I'm like, think about it now and I'm like man that was just that was so embarrassing um but there was this one game I don't know if you've seen this or played it yourself um that uh was we called it the banana challenge um and so you would take a pair of pantyhose and you would put it on your face and then you would try to eat a banana through the pantyhose so Basically, you take a banana and like try to smush it in in your face and try to get it to squeeze through the teeny tiny holes in the pantyhose. And so you're you're making baby food and then feeding yourself baby banana food. It was so fun. It was so great. Totally not embarrassing. Girl. Then there was another one. And there was two. There's two versions of this one. There's a gross version and there's a really gross version. So uh, we called it the sock and coke challenge. And, and what you would do is you would, if you were nice, okay, you would bring a brand new out of the package tube sock you would open a can of coke you would put the tube sock over the can of coke and then you try to drink the coke through the sock then there was a gross version the gross version was that you would take the sock off your foot and put it on the and and here's what's crazy about this okay because like these sound the the crazy thing is this kids volunteered for these things Right? There was no like convincing. It was like, it was like we're going to play a game. They're like, I want to do it. And it's like, do you know what you're going to do? I don't care. And then they would come and play these games. And they'd do these games. And they'd do these games for prizes that were honestly not even like that great. It was like a free slice of pizza. Like, come and try to eat a banana through a pantyhoe in front of everybody. And then we're going to give you a free slice of pizza. The best was like if you had like a snack shack or like a cafe at your student ministry, then you would be able to offer them like a free Coke and a free candy bar. And it's like, you're going to drink a soda through your own sock for a free piece of candy. Cool. Um, I thought about bringing some props today and, and seeing if anyone here would be interested in trying one of the challenges. And, and I was just, I was really just kind of curious, like, what amount of money would I have to offer to get someone to get up here and, and, and do it? Like, I was like, as a teenager, right, you might be willing to do that for a free slice of pizza, but I don't really know any adult that's hurting for a slice of pizza so bad that they're going to, like, drink a Coke through their own sock. That that's probably not... Right? And so I was like, what, what would we have to offer? What amount of money would we have to offer in order to get, get an adult to agree uh, to do this? Because as your frontal cortex fully forms, you realize that some of the things that you did were not the smartest ideas. Um, and then I just talked about the, the truth that like as adults, you and I, we are constantly weighing the value of things and the cost of things that we make decisions based on weights and values every single day of the week, right? Every single day that you wake up and decide to go to your job, you are deciding that the amount of effort and time that you give to your company, organization, your job, your position is worth the amount of money that they will pay you at the end of that week or every two weeks or every month, however, whenever you get paid. That you decide my time is worth this amount of money that you agree to this you enter into it maybe you think it's worth more but you take what you get right and then we are constantly doing this right you go out and you make purchases and you're making decisions of this this is worth this amount of money and so i will pay this and not even just with that but all kinds of decisions that we make are based on this is going to take this amount of effort it's worth it because the reward is worth it we are continually making those decisions 
And then there are circumstances, there are situations where we decide to do things and, and the, the cost of what it, what it costs in order to accomplish or to gain that thing, whatever it is, uh, is, is so valuable that we don't even consider, we don't even, it doesn't even matter what it's going to cost us, that we're going to do it and we will do anything and everything we have to in order to accomplish or gain or, or access this. One of the first examples that came to mind for me uh, is as, as we get closer to the start of the Olympics, the, like Olympic athletes, the amount of effort and training and time, the diet restrictions, the workouts, the fact that like most Olympic athletes are not even paid athletes. Did you know this? Do you know that Olympic athletes, most of them, they're not making millions of dollars like professional basketball players, baseball players, football players, hockey players. Like they're not making most of the time, competing in the Olympics actually costs Olympic athletes like tens of thousands of dollars in order for them to do it. And then most of them don't even ever see like brand deals. Like they, they, they make no money. So there's no monetary gain, but they will compete their entire lives. They will train. Like you talk about like gymnastics, right? Like people, people who compete in the gymnastic field, they'll train from like five or six years old until they can compete for the first time in the Olympics. And every single decision they make for their entire life is to base them around whether or not it's going to get them closer or further to their goal of being on that Olympic gymnastic team. Every decision, every thought, every focus, it all goes back to that. Will it get me there? And then you watch interviews where they talk about what they have to give up and the diets that they're eating and, and the workouts that they're doing and how they have like no social life and, and, and the, their entire world is wrapped up in this one goal and not a single one of them who makes the Olympic team would look at you and say, yeah, it wasn't worth it. Every single one of them is like, I would do it again. I would do it again. Why? Because for them, the goal of being on the Olympic team is worth whatever it cost them. Like, it doesn't matter. They will do whatever because it is worth it. They don't even, it, it's not even like, a, it's not a conversation that they have. It's not that they have to like sit and contemplate. Man, I would really like a slice of pizza, but I gotta, you know, like they, they don't, they don't have, right? It's not those conversations, the conversations that I have where I convince myself that it's okay that I have another donut because I went and did this this week. Like, it's not the same. Because for them, the gold, the, the reward, what it is that they gain is so much greater, so beyond anything else that the idea of whatever it may cost them, it's, it's just secondary. It's just secondary. It's just like, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so today as we continue, continue and nearly wrap up our series in Exodus, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 33. And, and we're picking up where we left off last week with the story of the creation of the, uh, the, the golden calf. So Israel is waiting on Moses' return. Moses was gone for like 40 days and 40 nights, and they're afraid that he's dead or just taken off. And so they go to Aaron, and they say, hey, we need you to make us a god for us to follow. And so Aaron gathers their jewelry, and he makes this golden calf, and they begin worshiping this golden calf as God, um, making sacrifices to it. And Moses comes back, and and he rebukes them and gets things back under control. And, and, and God, at one point, he's like, I'm just going to, like, smite them. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take care of them, and then we're going to start over with you, Moses. And, and Moses has the conversation with God where, where God says, okay, I'm, I'm not going to. I will spare them. But even though God decides to spare them, there are still consequences for what took place. And as we continue in Exodus chapter 33, we are continuing to deal with the consequences from what happens in Exodus chapter 32. And I'm calling the message this morning um, presence, presence. So Exodus, Exodus 33, starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. 
Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from the Mount Horeb onward. So this takes place after the, the issue and the story of the golden calf. After the issue of the golden calf, God goes to Moses. He says, Moses, we're going to continue the plan. I've promised your people. I've promised this people that they will inherit the promised land, the land that I promised them, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land that they will prosper in. And I will continue that. I'm going to send an angel who's going to go out before you. This angel is going to drive the current inhabitants of that land out for you. And then you guys will go and you will receive it as I promised. But here's the deal, Moses. I'm not going anymore. I'm not going anymore. And when Moses tells Israel of this reality, Israel begins deeply mourning. They begin deeply mourning that they know that this is a disastrous thing. They break down and they grieve and they grieve hard that they that none of them put on their fancy robes, their fancy outfits, but instead they were dressing as though you would dress when you were grieving the loss of a loved one. That they're grieving. They're grieving the loss. Why are they grieving the loss? What has just happened that is so disastrous and so crazy that Israel is responding the way that they are? For Israel, God's absence would change everything. God's absence would change everything. God has promised that they will still inherit the land, but his presence is not continuing with them. As I was reading this this week, there were just a couple of questions that came to mind for us to ask and, 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 and work through. The first question is, would God removing his presence impact our daily lives? If God were to remove his presence, not just would that impact my Sunday morning, but would that impact my Monday? Would that impact my Wednesday? What about Friday night? Would my Friday night change at all if God were to remove his presence from me? The second question is, if God were to remove his presence from me, would I know? Would I even recognize it's not there anymore? Second, would I care? Would I care? For Israel, they are driven into deep grief because the absence of God would change everything. Everything for them would be changed. And we're told why as the story continues. And this next section is kind of, it like interrupts the narrative, right? And so it's almost like a, a parenthetical note that the author, the narrator gives us that like this is important information that you need to know and be aware of as you continue the story. And so in verse seven, it says, now Moses used to, past tense take the tent and pitch it outside the camp far off from the camp and he called it the tent of meeting and everyone who sought the lord would go out to the tent of meeting which was outside the camp whenever moses went out to the tent all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch moses until he had gone into the tent when moses entered the tent the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the lord would speak with moses and when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. So we're told this is the usual process. This is what Moses would usually do. Moses would set up a tent outside of the camp, and this tent was called the Tent of Meeting. And this is the place that people would go when they wanted to meet with God. This is where they would go. And this is where Moses would go when he was meeting with God. But there's an important note that's made, that every single time that Moses would go out to the tent, not just Moses was impacted, but everyone within the nation of Israel was impacted. When they saw him going out to the tent of meeting, they would go out in front of their tents and they would watch as Moses went. And Moses, when Moses went into the tent of meeting and the pillar of cloud that represented the presence of God descended on the tent and they knew that Moses was meeting with God, that they would bow down and worship and they would worship the whole time he was in there. 
their entire world circulates around when Moses and God meet. It would stop everything else that they were doing, and they would do this. Why? Because the presence of God was the most important thing. The presence of God was the most important thing for Israel. That God's absence would change everything because their lives are built around his presence. Because their lives are built around his presence. That was the main thing. That was the focus. That was the goal. That was the source. The source was the presence of God. And so that's what dictated their schedule. That's what dictated what they did. That's what dictated their their decisions was the very presence of God. For you and I, our lives should be built around his presence. That the most important thing for each of us should be the presence of God Because without the presence of God, we have nothing. Without his presence, we have nothing. And I think it's important for us to ask questions like, what is your life built around? What is my life built around? What's at the center, at the core of my decision making? What dictates and controls my schedule? What dictates and controls things that I do and things that I don't do? What is priority number one truly? Not just in what I communicate with my mouth and not just what my Facebook page says and not just what my, the header on my titles say in my emails, but what truly is most important? Is his presence the main thing? Another question to ask is, can you do what you do each day in your own power? Can you do what you do each day in your own power? I think a challenging and a scary question and a scary thought is that you and I could spend our entire lives doing great things and we're doing them all in our own ability and not his. On our own strength and not his. When you think about your week, your life, your time, how you spend it, what you prioritize, what you do, what you accomplish, is there a point in time in your week that requires you to get on your knees before the Father because you can't continue doing what you're doing unless he shows up? Because the truth is, the truth is, is that none of us can do good, truly do good, apart from him. But unless he is present, we cannot do what we've been called to do. We can't live as we've been called to live. Without him as the source, as the strength, as the cause, as the driver, we can't do it. And the reason we can't do it is Because while it's not necessarily a pleasant and a happy thought, the truth is is that we as human beings are not mostly good. And we're not born mostly good. We are born mostly evil. If you don't believe me, spend some time with a toddler this week and then come back and talk to me. (laughs) Spend some time with a toddler and come back and tell me that you and I are born with a natural inclination to share and be kind and not demand our own way. Like, like, like seriously. Good behavior, moral decisions are taught. It's not born. The difference between a child that we would say, oh, such a sweet and kind, caring child, and that toddler is that somewhere in the middle, someone had to correct the behavior. In the same way, there is nothing good that you and I can do in our own strength. It's the entire point of salvation. It's the entire point of Christ. You and I can't do it. 
that for me to be the parent I'm called to be, the husband I'm called to be, the, 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 the employee, the friend, the coworker, for us to do anything that we've been called to do, it is completely and utterly dependent and reliant on the presence of God giving us the ability to do it. And that many times we may find ourselves exhausted, tired, worn out. We want to give up and throw in the towel. And the truth is, is because we've probably been trying to do it in our own strength and not his. Whether we want to or not, you and I have been created to operate within the presence of God exclusively. And we can build our lives around a whole lot of other stuff. But if it's not built around his presence, it doesn't work. For Israel, they built their lives around the presence of God. And so the idea of it being gone devastated them. And as I was going through this this week, just this question kept coming back of like, Lord, I, I hope and I pray and I submit to you and I, and I confess if there are times that I have, but God, like, let me not live my life in my own power. God, I hope and I pray that there's not a single week that I get through the entire week And there wasn't a moment that I know that unless you were there, I would not have made it. For us to understand our true dependence, his presence. The narrative picks up again in verse 12. It says, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, speaking of God, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, this very thing you have spoken I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So after Moses gets this word from the Lord saying, hey, I'm I'm going to go. I'm going to send my angel before you. He's going to prepare the way. This is important because this is the, the, the reward. This is the blessing. The blessing of God is the promised land. That's what God promised Israel. That's what God promised all the way back to Abram. Abraham, when he said, I'm going to make you a great nation, I'm going to make you a great name, you're going to be a great people, and I'm going to give you a land, a great land, a prosperous land that your people will inhabit, and and you will grow, and you'll be as numerous as the sand and seashores, as as numerous as the stars in the sky. This is the blessing of God. This is the blessing that God bestowed on Israel, his chosen people. God says, I'm still going to give you that, but I'm not going. concern and and sometimes a criticism for for believers Um, and this is foundational to humanity this is at the core of the book of Job is the question of if there was no blessing would we still choose him do we follow God do we seek his presence because we want his presence or because of what he can do for us If we were given the option and the opportunity to receive the blessing of God without the presence of God, would we choose the blessing over his presence? Let 
Moses comes before God and, and, and he wants clarification. He wants God to explain the plan because the plan doesn't make any sense to Moses. He's like, I don't, I don't understand how this is going to work. And, and, and this goes back to Moses and God's first conversation when, when God meets with Moses in the burning bush and he tells Moses he's going to go and free Israel from slavery in Egypt. And he says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you're going to tell him to let my people go. And Moses is like, who am I? Who am I to speak before Pharaoh? Who, who, who am I to lead the nation of Israel? Like, I'm nobody. And then God's response to him is, I am with you. But here's the thing. God is saying, go, lead these people up. I'm going to give you the promised land, but I'm not going. And Moses is like, wait, 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 wait. The whole answer to whenever you said you're going to, that I'm to lead Israel out of Egypt into the promised land is that you're with me. But the whole question of like, God, who am I? It hasn't changed. So God, how is, how is this going to work? If you don't go, if your presence doesn't go, like explain to me how this is going to work because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Moses asks, how, how can we exist apart from you? And so God sees, he sees Moses' heart. He sees that Moses understands the truth and understands his, his need for the presence of God. And so he says, I will go with you. And he says, I will go with you and I will give you rest. Because Moses, he is worried, just like the rest of the nation of Israel is worried, that the only cure to their worry is the presence of God. It's for them to know that God goes with them. And so God says, I will go with you. I will go with you. And then Moses continues showing more of the cause of his worry. He says, if you won't go with us, then I won't go. If you won't go with us, I, I won't go. God, you said you're going to give us the promised land. You're going to prepare the way. You're going to give it to us just like you said you were. But God, if your presence doesn't go, I'm not going either. If you don't go, I won't go. God, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about the blessing if, if your presence isn't with it. My focus and my goal is not what you can do for me. My focus and my goal is to simply be in your presence. And he continues, he talks about how, he, he asks, how, how, can, how can I have the favor of God if you're not with me? How can we be the people of God if you are not present with us? What will distinguish or separate us from all the other people if your presence isn't there? That Moses understands and he knows that without God's presence, they're nothing. Without God's presence, they're nothing. That, that what distinguishes and separates the people of Israel? That God chose them and he was present with them. That's what distinguishes them. What distinguishes and separates believers from non-believers? God's presence, that's it. It is the very presence of God that changes and shapes and molds. It's his presence that separates and distinguishes. It's his presence that, that changes. It's his presence that gives authority. It's his presence that, that, that brings about the goodness and, and, and the kindness and the joy and the patience. That's the source of all of it. Without his presence... We have nothing. Without his presence, we have nothing. This is why the apostle Paul says, he says, he says, everything else I consider filthy rags. Meaning everything else, I, whatever it is, anything else that is not the presence of God that takes me away from the presence of God or prohibits me from experiencing the presence of God is trash. It's trash to be thrown out. This isn't something that like they're sitting and mulling over for months and months on end of maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. No, they just know. Why? How do they just know? They just know because once you experience the presence of God, you can't go back. going back once you've experienced it. But it can be something that we either choose to prioritize or not. 
Is his presence the greatest concern we have? Are we making decisions and doing things based on whether or not it's going to bring us closer to him? Or are there other questions that we are asking and making decisions around that are honestly just less important? Not less impactful. I understand that there are a lot of things that determine the decisions you make for your life and, and what you do and, and how you live. And, and, and I get it. And I have those questions just like you. Right? Life is full of we have to make decisions and we make decisions to live and eat and everything else. But if all our decisions we're making based on other questions other than is this going to bring me closer into the presence of God, then I think we're spending more time asking less important questions than we should be spending asking important questions. Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life. and There is no other way to the Father but through Him than to draw nearer to Him, to do better at it at abiding and remaining and existing and walking in his presence, there is no greater question for us to spend our days asking and seeking. And there's an opportunity for the Spirit to speak to us and speak to the truth of who he is in us and how he's working in us and to reveal maybe some things in us that currently have a priority over his presence to ask, like, God, would I, would I give up blessings if the option was either this good thing or your presence. Like, would we make the decision if God was like, hey, like, your house is going to be great, and there's never going to be problems, and your car is always going to run, it's never going to break down, and you're going to absolutely live your job, and you're going to have the, the success and the popularity and blah, 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 and everything else. And he's like, you can have all of this, but just know I'm not in it. It's a good test of like, God, where, where is my priority? Where is my heart truly? Like, if, do you have my heart? Because if he has my heart, then like there's nothing. There's nothing that's worth losing his presence. And then it doesn't have to be something that we process and think. But much like an Olympic athlete, it's just like, no, like, what, what, like whatever it is. <laughs> be with you, to know you, to walk with you, to experience your presence and your glory in more intimate and deeper and deeper ways. Like, that's it, God. That's what I want. That's what I need. With that, I have everything. Without it, I have nothing. We don't ask these questions to cause doubt. This is a shift that I'm seeing that I believe something that God's kind of pointing out to me more getting into scripture because I grew up in a very loving and encouraging environment um, but I grew up in a rather kind of traditional uh, religious context so I struggled for a really long time and still do um, with performing say that performing the right thing, doing the right thing, always saying the right thing, always doing the right thing. Um, and I think sometimes I would like read passages of scripture that I truly believe that Paul and others wrote to be a source of encouragement and reminder for the believer, for believers, not necessarily something for them to beat themselves up over. Um, but then I would read them and like beat myself up over it. <laughs> And so as I'm going through, and so even like this week as I was going through and preparing this, and I'm like, man, like, one, I, I do, I really want to strongly emphasize just the necessity of his presence and that it has to be our priority. And if it's not, it's not going to serve us well. And that we will see, we will see cracks form, we will see issues come about, because like, like without his presence in our lives, that truly, the, the, the Bible doesn't just say that because it sounds good. The Bible says it because it is true. But also it's just a reminder of like, hey, like, like this is true of you. If you are in Christ and you've experienced his presence, there is no going back. And it really is at the core of your heart. It really is the priority. But sometimes I think the core of our heart doesn't necessarily get to make the decisions. Sometimes it's more of our flesh. And so we need times to be reminded because our mind is being renewed. As scripture says, we are experiencing the renewing of our mind, that our heart has been changed 
right? He has swapped the heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and now Christ is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us, and he is the source from which everything else comes and grows and changes, and he is beginning to change us from one degree to the next. And so there's a process of change, a transformation that takes place. And some of that, and many of that, I think, is just a renewing of the mind. It's a changing and shaping of the mind of like, you know, like this really isn't the priority. This really isn't the most important thing to me. And so I need to spend more time focusing on what is. So that begins to reveal and show itself, not just through my words, but also through my actions, through decisions that I make. What a really kind of funny, uh, just image just to, to kind of like solidify this and drive this home. Um, so I don't know if, if you ever uh, had like a, a used toy, you know, one that was like given to you or you got a garage sale or bought it at like a secondhand store, like a battery toy, but it didn't come with the batteries because they never had the batteries, right? And most of them don't even have the compartment that closes the batteries anymore, right? And so there were several times that we had toys, whether it was like given to us or we bought it used, a garage sale, whatever. And, and we, we would get them, we would play with them, and they didn't have batteries. They were designed to have a battery, but they didn't. And me and my brothers, we would play with them. And we didn't care. We didn't care it didn't have batteries in it. Like, right, we'd, we had only ever played with the toy without batteries, okay? But then there were also toys that we got new, toys that were new that came with batteries. And we would play with a toy with the battery. And then as soon as the battery died, I would pester and pester and pester and pester and pester, and I would not let my parents go without replacing the batteries in the toy. Why? Because once you've experienced the toy that designed it was the way it was designed to be played with, with the power of the battery inside, you can't go back. You can't go back. This is the very same with the presence of God. Before you knew Christ, there was a point in time that you were walking and living your life and you had no idea that there was something deeply missing inside of you. And life was great and things worked well and maybe you had a good time for the most part and, and you didn't really realize you, there was something that was missing. But then as soon as you experience the presence of God in your life, it's like putting a battery in the toy you didn't know and it transforms and changes everything. And now there is no going back to playing with the toy without the battery anymore. It's the same with his presence. Once we have experienced the power of his presence and what it brings to the table and how you and I, we were created. We are created to exist in the presence of God. It is why we were made. And so once you experience that, there is no going back. And sometimes we just need the reminder that that needs to be our focus. For us to come back to seeking the very presence of God. But I believe that so much else comes out of that. The growth and the change and the transformation that is necessary, the fruit that we'll begin producing, the fruit is produced because you and I are abiding in the vine, not because we're making it happen ourselves. So Brennan and the band are going to lead us in some worship this morning. And my encouragement for you is, is this. Um, just be present. Just be present. Just be here. Now the hope is not that this becomes the only place you experience the presence of God. Because it can't be. It shouldn't be. But the hope is, is that this will create a deep longing inside each of us. That when we gather together and we worship and and we are reminded once again of what his presence can do and, 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 and the experience that we can have that it will motivate and drive us to where experiencing that just on Sundays isn't an option anymore. But we long and crave his presence each and every single day of the week. And I just want you to be encouraged and, and respond however it is that you need to today whatever way. We have communion here at the front for you to come and take. We have it in the back as well. As you feel led, come and take as you feel led. His body that was broken, his blood that was shed, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need to sit and pray, if you need prayer, I'm going to be in the back. I would love to pray with you. Stand and worship however you need to respond. I just encourage you to respond. And, and let me leave you with this. First, if there's anyone here who has not experienced his presence, you are here and, and, and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior.
is nothing greater. There is nothing greater than the love of Christ who sees value in you. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you can bring to the table, but because he has made you. nothing greater than the presence of God. And for you, I, we admit we are sinners and we have fallen short of the glory of God. We believe that Jesus is the Lord, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the only way to the Father. That he died on the cross for your sins just for sins, but my sins. He died for my sins. And then you choose him. You don't just choose him once. You choose him over and 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 over. If you admit you're a sinner, you believe that he, he is the son of God, that he came down the cross for your sins, that you might be saved, and you choose to follow him, that by these that you and I might be saved, and we may enter into his presence. It's a free gift. It's offered to each and every single one of us. And so if you are here and you have never received that before, why not today? Choose that today. Choose to receive this today. For everyone here who is, you are, you are saved, you are redeemed. You have experienced his presence, but maybe it's been a while. You feel like it's been a while. You feel like he's distant. The truth is, is that he doesn't go anywhere. It's us who drift. You can do it today. He is never far. Scripture says, if you ask, it will be answered. If you knock, it will be opened. If you seek, you will find. God is not playing hide and go seek. He's just waiting for you to be like, hey, I'm, in, I'm interested. And he's always interested. seek his presence you're here today and the Lord has been pulling and laid something on your heart that you're just like I really need to let this go or I really need to give this up or really need to whatever whatever it is it is nothing in comparison to his presence anything and everything that he ever calls us to surrender or walk away from is worth it because his presence is everything and if we have that we have everything if we don't we have nothing so let me pray and then we can respond
live in our own power, try to live in our own power, we prioritize other things. That you will forgive us. You can help us to keep the main thing the main thing. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just move this morning. of who you are, your goodness, your grace. Remind us of your strength. We thank you so much for Jesus, for the price that he paid.
darkness falls, you won't breathe it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Somebody declare that name. Oh my God will never fail. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you.
give another shot of victory in this room. Well, good afternoon, Axiom. What an awesome day to worship our Lord. Every day is an awesome day to worship our King because that is who He is. He is our sovereign. He is our King. He is the one we serve. If this is your first time at Axiom, welcome. I'm Pastor Matt. I serve as the discipleship pastor here. Um, you heard Pastor Christian. Or, yeah, woo. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I get to uh, run small groups and make sure that they're running smoothly and help build the health and the growth of the church and such. It is such a blessing to serve you guys in our community. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, if this is your first time here, welcome. Um, we ask you that you would stop by the, the connections counter and fill out a first-time guest card. When you do that, we actually donate $5 as an honorarium to Shelter House Ministries, which help women and children who are in deep need. And so if this is your second time here, you come and you fill out another connections card, mark the returning guest box, and we actually give you a five, oh, well, Excuse me, it's a non-monetary. It is a free drink gift card to Boomerang Coffee Lounge, which is actually pretty darn awesome. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Boomerang. It's in the Ashman Circle. Um, they have some of the best coffee in Midland. I will stand on that. Seriously, I'm not joking. It is awesome. So if this is your second time, do not miss out on that opportunity. Um, if this is something that uh, you call home, our church home, and you want to, uh, to be sacrificially generous, which is one of our, our rhythms that we learned in the Rooted program. We have three ways to give here. We have the old-fashioned way where we do check or cash in the gray box over there. We also have our giving online, which you can go to axiom.church and give to us directly. Or we use the Tithely app as well, where you can go to the Tithely app and securely donate to us there. Um, we have a couple of big announcements. We have soon to come up next month. I believe it's August 9th. It's our next Agape night. Yeah, so if you haven't been to an Agape night, you're missing out. I'm telling you what. We had almost 60 people at Plymouth Park at our last one. We had food. We had fellowship. We had worship. It was just a great opportunity. The kids got to play. There was a giant mud puddle, and the kids were sliding in it. It was crazy, and the food was phenomenal. The fellowship, even better. So we have small groups coming up, too, starting in September. Yeah, so we currently have one small group going right now, which is a rooted group that I'm leading, and they are doing phenomenal. But guess what? We have more opportunities coming in September, which is going to be great. Also, um, as Pastor Christian asked earlier, I ask that you guys continue to pray over our youth group as they prepare to go on their missions trip to Butler, Pennsylvania. They are going to need lots of prayer because that's what we do. That's the strongest weapon we have in our toolbox, right? is Jesus Christ. And so when we reach out to him, he hears us, and he will do what he does because he is a faithful God. And with that being said, thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, which washed away everything that we have ever done and ever will do because you are a loving God, and you love the creation that you made. We thank you wholly for your Father who sent you down to us and for your Holy Spirit, which continues to give us wisdom and power through your name. In your holy name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Have a good day, guys. Jesus Christ, from the beginning.